Good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Auslander, the director of MSU, uh, MSU's museum. I'm uh, also an associate professor of anthropology and history here at, uh, at Michigan State. And it is our honor tonight to open an exhibition that we've been working on now for intensely for six months, Finding Our Voice, Sister Survivors Speak. It's a project that has been developed uh, closely and collaboratively with uh, our community co-curators who are here, whom you'll hear from as we go on through this evening. We have a very special guest tonight, and here to introduce her is our uh, chair of our board of trustees here at Michigan State University, Diane Byram. Thank you, Mark, and good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce Michigan's 49th governor. Throughout her career, she's been a strong advocate for women's health and for sexual assault awareness. Earlier this month, she proclaimed April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month in Michigan. She's a longtime public servant, having served in the State House from 2001 to 2006, and then in the State Senate, where she was the first woman elected as the Democratic leader until 2015. She stepped in as Ingham County Prosecutor in 2016, where she established a domestic violence and sexual assault unit among other reforms. And she's a Spartan, a graduate of MSU's College of Communications, Arts and Sciences, and MSU College of Law, where she graduated magna cum laude. She has taught at both Michigan State University and the University of Michigan. I look forward to welcoming her back to campus for graduation ceremonies on May 3rd, where she will address our advanced degree recipients. We are so pleased she could join us tonight to open this exhibition. Please join me now in welcoming my friend and the governor of the great state of Michigan, Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Well, thank you. I want to start by thanking all of you for being here today. Uh, I want to um, first thank some of the organizations that have partnered with the MSU Museum who helped to make this possible. Uh, the Army of Survivors, the Firecracker Foundation, Small Talk Children's Assessment Center, MSU Relationship Violence and Sexual Misconduct Expert Advisory Work Group, the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic Violence and Sexual Violence, and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And finally, and most importantly, I want to thank the survivors. Um, this exhibit is powerful, and uh, when you go through it, you will see why I am uh, struggling to keep my composure. Um, you know, the survivors and allies who put this together did so uh, because of the strength that it gives them to tell their stories, to take back their voices, to own their own narratives. And I encourage everyone to come through this museum and take the time to actually absorb every part of it. It is a story that starts in pain and moves to um, an evolution of, of understanding and growth but it is also a story that we are reminded is one that they will carry with them every day of their lives. And the most powerful thing I've ever seen is someone who turns grief or a hard experience into a cause to help others, to make the world a better place for other people. And that's why this is so powerful. And we've done some good work together over the years. We've undoubtedly got a lot more to do. But this museum and the stories that, that this describes are um, incredibly inspirational, devastating, sad, and wonderful in different ways as you, get, as you walk through the exhibit. And I want to thank the survivors um, for being so bold and the university for moving forward with this. There is much work to do on this campus and every campus in our country, frankly. But this is an important 
moment where we are acknowledging to all of the survivors that we believe you, we support you, we owe you gratitude for the work that you have done and the lifetime that you are going to lead with this. Some of you will go on to become advocates and become, be an advocate every day for the rest of your lives. Others may just do something boring like become governor of the state of Michigan. <laughs> but every one of you will carry this. It will be a part of you and I hope and I pray for you that it will be something that continues to strengthen you as a collective that empowers you to continue to raise your voice at injustice, at um, institutional structures that don't embrace uh, dissent, and it will continue to make our state and our country a safer place. Uh, you're sending a message to all the people of the state of Michigan that we need to create an environment where people can come forward and be treated with respect. And as a survivor myself, you've encouraged and inspired me, and I want you to know that, every one of you. We have work to do, and we are going to continue to work together. I want to thank you, every single one of you, and at this time, it is my um, responsibility and privilege in a certain way to officially declare this exhibit open and encourage everyone in this community and across our state to come and see this. We will do better. Thank you. And now we, uh, the governor has graciously consented to use these very large scissors <laughs> uh, uh, to cut the the teal ribbon uh, and, uh, and officially open the exhibit. And we're asking sister survivors who are, who are present, who would like to join her to flank her. Um, Mimi and Amanda, I think, are gonna come forward and stand right next to her on either side. And everybody else is gonna come up. And there will be a photograph, I believe. So perhaps if you can come around to this other side of the ribbon, on this side, please. Uh, just follow everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. We've seen many transformations at, at, at MSU. We are excited, uh, all of us, by our, our, our new Board of Trustees under the leadership of our next speaker, uh, the chair of our Board of Trustees, Diane Byram. Good evening again. I would like to acknowledge my colleague, Trustee Kelly Tebe, joining us this evening. I've been asked to provide a brief welcome as for the opening of the Finding Our Voice Sister Survivors Speak. Here, somewhere between the old bones and cultural artifacts, the MSU Museum has become a campus center for healing conversations around the issue of sexual assault. Museums today can and should be places to examine contemporary issues through our material culture in as many forms of expression. It's great that the MS Museum is willing to take on subjects that are of vital concern to our campus community and to our society. 
With finding our voice, it isn't only the subject matter that is so consequential, but the way the exhibit was developed in partnership with the sister survivors and their families. It's a very land-grant sort of engaged approach. But more importantly, such community co-curation lends these exhibits an authenticity that might be impossible to reach otherwise. So I want to commend Mark Oslander and his staff and the survivors and allies who partnered with the museum for their collaboration on this project. We are so deeply grateful for the survivors' engagement and the, exhibit, and the extension of trust it required to help create an exhibit that is both honest and meaningful. I know this has been a deeply moving process to create an exhibition that, is so collabor that so collaboratively showcases the survivors' art, poetry, pose, and stories, while at the same time giving expression to hope for their future. Sorrow and pain are represented here too, but this exhibit ultimately is a life-affirming testimonial to these young women's courage and resilience. And so I'm pleased to share this opening with you today. Acting President Upta could not be here to join us, but he still wanted to say and share a few words. He recorded a brief video message, and we would like to, ex to play that video for you now. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm sorry I can't be with you, but it gives me great pleasure to have a small role in this opening reception, if only by video. This exhibit honors our deepening commitment to listening carefully and respectfully to survivors of sexual violence on our campus. It emerged from a careful and collaborative process that brought together sister survivors, allies, and museum staff. It asks us to reflect on institutional accountability, to honor the voices and stories of all survivors and to work towards a world free of sexual violence. As you will see, at the heart of this exhibit is an installation evoking a grove of trees covered with more than 200 teal bows. Those same bows wrap trees around our campus from February to July last year. Our campus trees, some of which have stood for centuries, are among our greatest treasures. They have offered shelter to students, faculty and staff through our joys and our tribulations for generation after generation. How appropriate that last year, survivor parents were drawn to these trees to pay their tribute to their daughters and to express their hopes for individual and collective healing. We are grateful that these ribbons found safekeeping here at MSU Museum, where so many artifacts of our history and memory are preserved. We are grateful as well to our sister survivors, their family members and their allies and to the museum staff who worked together to create this exhibition. This collaborative process models for us the spirit of compassion and partnership that we so deeply need as together we take the next steps forward in our healing journey. Our next speaker who represents this part of the state, who represents Michigan State, has been a strong and consistent and principled allies, ally of the survivors, Senator Curtis Hertel, Jr. Thank you. You know, when you serve in the Senate, there are all kinds of honors that people give you. They give you a title, um, they give you awards sometimes. Uh, I can think of nothing uh, more humbling or any greater honor than being asked to be part of this. Uh, I, I w was walking through um, earlier and to see the souls of all of you, really, is just so, it's, it's incredibly beautiful and moving and I, I can't, uh, to play a small part in any of this, I greatly appreciate it. I, I think in great moments of uh, history, we have to look back and, at reflection. And uh, 
you have already changed the world. I'm sure there are days that it does not feel like enough, but the, the tone and tenor of our national conversation and really our world conversation has changed. There are survivors all across this world that you touched and that you inspired to speak out. Uh, there is so much value in that. And Michigan law changed, not enough. But uh, we started moving towards a state that held people accountable. Uh, all that being said, we have more work to do. Your work is not done and neither is mine. Uh, we must change our laws so that there is no rock, no statute of limitations, no protections for perpetrators or those that hid them ever. <laughs> and until we do that and we change our culture, uh, today on the Senate floor, uh, I introduced uh, Senate Bill 270 uh, to uh, teach in all of our classrooms across the state affirmative consent. Uh, I don't like it when politicians can only see women as their daughters or their mothers but, uh, or their wives. But I look at my own daughter and I know that she will be taught her entire life where not to walk, what not to wear, how to take care of her drink, to walk with her keys, uh, to protect herself, and the boys in her class will not be taught not to be perpetrators. Uh, we have a responsibility to ensure that happens and I won't stop until it does. We must change the world so that every survivor is owed three things. One, we believe you. Two, whether you're, you are only able to whisper it to yourself, we believe you. Uh, that you are stronger than you think you are. Uh, and that we will change this world together. And I can promise you that I will not stop fighting and none of us will stop fighting until we change this world. Thank you. Through the work of Senator Hertel and, and others uh, in the legislature, uh, there is now a resolution. Would you care to uh, present that? Oh, sure. To um, Perhaps we could ask uh, Grace, Amanda, and Mary Whirl, our, our curator, uh, to come up and receive it, <laughs> if that's all right. Both Amandas. <laughs> Uh, so these um, special tributes are some of the most important things we can do as legislators. They honor our constituents that have done uh, important work. Um, and this is signed by myself, uh, Representative Brixey, and Governor Whitmer. Uh, and we just want to thank you for all you've done for our community uh, and the state. And uh, we want to present this to you and hopefully uh, it can hang to honor uh, each of you uh, in your commitment and service to the state. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, Attorney General uh, Dana Nessel couldn't be here tonight, but she is represented by our Solicitor General, uh, Fadwa Hamoud. Thank you. Good evening. As Solicitor General of the state, I am honored to be addressing you tonight and even more honored to be standing alongside of you. But as a mother, as a woman, and as a daughter, I salute you. I admire you, and I'm thankful that we are here and that we are here together. 
I'm happy to stand here on behalf of our Attorney General, Dana Nessel, for such a necessary cause and a worthwhile event. Regrettably, she couldn't be here, but I'd like to share with you a few words that our Attorney uh, General, Dana Nessel, prepared. I'd like to thank the, sis the sister survivors and their allies for creating the Finding Our Voice exhibit. This exhibit sends a powerful message to all victims of sexual assault by reminding them they are not alone and need not suffer in silence. This exhibit also serves as a somber reminder of the work ahead of us to eradicate sexual violence in our communities and our campuses. To start, we must believe victims when they tell their stories. We must teach that silence does not mean consent. We must stop blaming victims of sexual violence for the terrible acts of those that commit these crimes against them. We must celebrate messages that empower young girls, messages that reinforce who you are is more important than how you look. We must condemn words and images that normalize gender-based violence. We must recognize the importance of education in raising awareness and assisting in prevention. We must remind our families, our friends, colleagues, teachers, neighbors, that we all play a crucial role in working to ensure that there are no more victims of sexual assault. We do this by using our voice to speak up and by listening to those who speak out. We do this by reminding each survivor's story, by remembering each survivor's story is unique and is important. And when woven together, tell a story too compelling to ignore. We must act in this way in all that we do so we can live in a world without sexual violence. I'm here today to join Attorney General Nessel and the entire department of the Michigan Attorney General in thanking the sister survivor, survivors for sharing their stories. Your courage is inspiring, your voices are powerful, and your actions give us hope that together we can make a change. And before I leave you, I salute you again. And on behalf of my daughter, Julia, girls and women, everywhere. I call on you to keep on resisting, keep on persisting, and continue to educate in order to empower. Thank you. Thank you, Solicitor General. Our U.S. Representative, Alyssa Slotkin, couldn't join us this evening, but she has prepared a video message, and we'll now hear from the Congresswoman. Hey everyone, I'm Alyssa Slotkin, Congresswoman for Michigan's 8th District, including Michigan State University. And I just wanted to send my greetings. Um, I couldn't be here tonight for the Sister Survivor Speak event, uh, the exhibit at MSU, and I just wanted to send along my heartfelt thanks for everyone who supported it, um, and particularly to the survivor advocates who are telling their story, getting their voices heard, educating the community. I come from a service background. Both my husband and I are in service um, and have been for our whole careers. And I really believe that reaching out to people who are different than you and telling your story is a form of service to your community and to your country. So thank you for doing it. Thank you for watching. Um, and I wish I could be there myself. Take care. Um, a year ago, many of you remember as we walked across campus this very dark, depressing, heartbreaking period where we felt all faith had been broken, where we knew that so many of the sister survivors had been portrayed, even by this institution. And we saw these amazing 228 or so ribbons across the campus trees. And every once in a while, we came across ribbons that said, thank you. In other words, not only the name or the victim number, but thank you. And those, if I remember correctly, Valerie, prepared by Valerie von Frank and the other parents and allies. And those were special thanks for a particularly heroic group. I mean, obviously all the survivors have been heroic in so many ways. And yet there's a particular group of the 
the so-called first uh, impact victims, who bravely allowed uh, their names, uh, their stories to be carried forward in the initial case, um, which helped to change the world. And here to represent that extraordinary group uh, of brave young women is Carol, Kaylee Lawrence. Thank you. My name is Kaylee Lorenz and I was a charged victim in this case. I stand here representing the nine women and girls who as of now represented over 500 victims. When I first realized I was in fact sexually assaulted, there was never a question that I would report, but I never anticipated how incredibly difficult that would be. I was prepared to tell my truth, but I never thought I would prepare myself to see him or to be questioned by his defense. In the end, that testimony cost me my identity due to his legal team. I hope I speak for all nine of us when I say that we are glad that we did. The feeling of walking into that very small courtroom, my abuser and his legal team staring at me, is a feeling that I will never forget. Since I first reported my abuse in 2016 and testified against my abuser, I have experienced a roller coaster of emotions in a journey that I never expected to be a part of. The university that I dreamed to attend now represents extreme grief and disappointment, and I'm not sure if or when that will ever change. As I look ahead, I can only hope that systematic changes where victims of sexual abuse are met with belief instead of doubt like we were as charged victims, to make this journey worth it. Our journey is not over, and all survivors deserve the same opportunity that we have been given. I hope that as you walk the steps of this museum, that you will remember the sacrifices that have been made. If we fail to realize the depth of what was allowed to occur, then we can't keep it from ever happening again. This army of sister survivors, working together as one voice, has managed to take down our abuser and his enablers, including those at the university who knew of his abuse. And we will keep fighting until all who knew are held accountable. I'm hoping to use my criminal justice degree to aid in my healing process, helping those who have experienced similar trauma or those who feel they have a voice that deserves to be heard. As difficult as this journey has been, the people I have met along the way have made a lasting impression on my life and will forever hold a special place in my heart. Lastly, I want to thank my sister survivors for helping to forge this path with me, as well as all of the support that we have had along the way. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Kelly. We all owe you, all nine of you, a great debt of gratitude. So the exhibition you're about to see emerged out of a complex collaboration between many, many people in this room and some who aren't here. But really chief uh, among uh, them were the 11 remarkable individuals who consented to be part of the Survivors and uh, Survivors and Allies Advisory Committee, um, who every, practically every day, um, uh, discussed, uh, argued, argued with, with us on the museum every day. We knew at the very beginning, <laughs> up to late last night as I recall, about one thing or another. But, and it was a necessary process of argumentation because we knew uh, at the museum that from the very beginning this needed to be a survivor-centered exhibition, but we had no idea how to do that. We, we Googled, we looked it up, no other museum had done a survivor-centered exhibition, and the one, only thing we knew was Denise and Teresa and Kelly and Mary all researched, and Chung Ann all researched this, is that no museum had done this seriously, and we couldn't do it alone. And Valerie was willing to do something that seemed impossible, which was to trust a few people at MSU at that moment and to convene a committee. And we've undergone an amazing journey and learned so much from one another. And the, the exhibition that you see is a testimony to the forthrightness and bravery argumentativeness, but also that, that clear, that firm, clear vision that all 11 members of the committee had and here to represent the committee 
um, are, um, uh, are several of them. Uh, 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 Melissa Hudich, uh, Katie Black, Amanda, uh, Amanda Smith, Amanda Thomas, Show, and Larissa Boyce. If you could come up to the podium and um, we'll hear from you. Thank you for being here. Finding Our Voice, Sister Survivors Speak was co-curated by a team of museum staff, sister survivors, and parents in a series of regular meetings and discussions that began last fall. The exhibit was inspired initially from an effort to preserve the teal bows hung on campus by parent Valerie Von Frank. It reflects the voices of the sister survivors in our ongoing journey to be heard, believed, and understood. It tells the uncomfortable truth of the impact of trauma on our lives. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the sister members of the committee, some of who are not here tonight. Uh, myself, Melissa Hudes, Amanda Smith, Katie Black, Amanda Tomashaw, Larissa Boyce, Marion Siebert, and Trinae Gonzakar. Sisters, thank you for the vulnerability trust, and emotional labor that it has taken to bring our collective story to life. Thank you for your perseverance in advocating for the things you each felt were most important to be heard. To all my sister survivors, thank you for trusting us to use your names, your images, words, and personal belongings in this exhibit. We hope that this exhibit is a step towards amplifying your voices as we take the next steps forward towards healing as a community. The parents were also a very important part of this exhibit. And I would like to call up Lieutenant Andrea Munford. She was not a parent herself, but she works on the RVSM committee, the Relationship Violence and Sexual Misconduct Committee. But for the parents, I would like to also call up Glenn Black. <laughs> Beth Esch. <laughs> and also Valerie Von Frank. While the parents of all the sister survivors may not necessarily be survivors of sexual assault themselves, they are still survivors. I hope that working to create this exhibit has helped them heal the way that it has helped me heal. They have been instrumental in the creation of this exhibit, and I would like to personally thank you all. It was. <laughs> It was these parents, as well as the other sister survivors on this committee that gave me the confidence to continue working on this project and to help put my voice in the exhibit as well. And this exhibit is an important representation of the past, but hopefully it is not a representation of the future and we will have better days to come. I would like to take the time to invite the following museum committee members to come forward and receive the recognition that you deserve. Mark Oslander. <laughs> Chang Anna Kanfora. <laughs> Teresa Goforth. Kelly Hansen, Mary Worrell,
and Denise Blair. I've gotten to spend the last year working with you all in different capacities, and I could not be prouder to stand here and say that I finally feel heard by someone, especially someone at Michigan State. You guys have been a lifeline for not only me, but for the other committee members. Throughout this process, and a simple thank you is just not enough. From the hundreds of emails, <laughs> the sometimes super stressful meetings, to creating tiles jamming out to the Beatles. <laughs> You've all made this process so much easier. I know we asked a lot of you, and sometimes it seemed like we were asking you to be the unstoppable force meeting the immovable object. But you listened, and you helped us find our voices again, and I will forever be thankful for that. So thank you. So, um, this exhibit has been a lot of work, and um, it's been, you'll see soon, it's really beautiful, and I just wanted to say that this exhibit, not only is it for my sister survivors, but it's, it's for all survivors. It's not just for the hundreds of wonderful souls who were abused while campus full of enablers looked the other way and ignored our warnings and reports. This exhibit is for every survivor on campus. Every human that carries the pain of victimization to class, to the study lounge, to their dorm room, where they're trying to sleep but they can't because the night nightmares keep them up and they're sweaty and screaming and there's tears streaming down their face. This is for every single Spartan that has been assaulted on campus, t failed by Title IX, fears reporting. This is for the survivors who walked onto this campus already scarred by sexual assault or rape, child abuse or incest. This is for Bailey, because we see you, we believe you, and we stand with you. And this is for 15-year-old Amanda, who can't really remember her first time because she just broke in her leg and was on a lot of painkillers. She knows it was it to a 19-year-old MSU wrestler who she met at IM West. Finding our voices for all of us. It's about finally listening to our voices, and the voices of all survivors on campus. It's about collectively coming together and changing this toxic culture that has persisted for far too long. It is about recognizing the evil that has been allowed to thrive on this campus and deciding enough is enough. So, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank everyone here that has helped in the creation of this exhibit. At times, I honestly felt like MSU's general counsel was gonna make it impossible for this exhibit to really honor survivors the way we deserve to be honored. And I even had to take some space for my duties as a committee member. But this group of people, they put this together and they were so kind and gracious and understanding. Working with them has been easy because they approach their work with compassion and they look at survivors with respect and adoration. Mark, Anna, Chong Anna, sorry, Mary, Teresa, Kelly, and Denise, all of you have been a blessing to work with, and I am so grateful for your dedication to not only honoring us, but also holding enablers accountable. And while being mindful of how trauma shows up in our lives, as well as the lives of all survivors on this campus. I'm also so incredibly grateful for my survivor family that has helped in the creation of this amazing exhibit. Glenn and Beth, I know this has been hard on you both and every parent involved in this tragedy. I could see it in your eyes at meetings and I could hear it in your voices, but you still showed up. So thank you for showing up and making sure this thing happened and making sure people don't forget. And Andrea, you believed us when no one else did. I'll never forget the day that you called me back in August of 2016 and you've been by my side ever since. Even when I wasn't ready, you were always there for me and you continue to be. Thanks for keeping me updated <laughs> when I wasn't feeling down or when I was feeling too down for meetings. It's literally case in point, you are always there. My sisters in this, 
Amanda, Melissa, Trine, Larissa, Katie, Marion. Look at this beautiful thing we created. Out of our pain, we keep finding ways to make this world a softer and safer, safer place from all that has come. And it's something really magnificent. I love you all so much. And of course, Valerie. None of this would be possible without you. You are our rock. You are our advocate through this entire process. I am forever grateful for your strength and your support, Valerie. Thank you so much for believing us and listening to us and fighting for us even when we couldn't, we didn't know how. Thank you. And to all members of Posse, I'd invite you all to stand now if you're here. Um, your support has meant so much to us. You started this, so thank you. Look at what we've done. <laughs> It's really great. Thank you. I'm not sure how I'm going to follow that. <laughs> um, okay. I know. I love you. I, love you. <laughs> um, I first reported my assault to an MSU employee back in 1997, and never ever would I have imagined that I would be standing here today. But I am because of one amazing woman who believed, finally, finally somebody believed, Andrea Munford. You made this all happen. probably cry later. <laughs> um, when I spoke during sentencing, I had one request. For adults, for media, and the world to remember what they saw unfold in that courtroom. To remember our stories and to keep talking about them. Our stories, along with countless others who have been sexually abused, provides important conversations and education for our homes and our communities. That is how we begin to change our, cul our, our culture and legislation in order to try and prevent something like this from ever happening again. So I want to say thank you to the curators and co-curators, along with my sisters and the parents, the sur survivor supporters, for having the courage to fight and push through all the negativity to make this exhibit a reality here at MSU. MSU can never forget their feelings that allowed such a horrendous thing to happen on its campus for 20 years. According to the national organization, RAIN, only one out of four assaults are reported. That is a very sobering thought, especially as we look around downtown East Lansing and see the teal flags, and we see the ribbons that are on the trees in the exhibit. Each one of those that's one out of four. Each one of those actually represents four girls, four boys. MSU needs to do better. MSU needs to believe and protect us because one out of four assaults and all of those flags and all of those teal ribbons, that's all been on MSU's campus. Thankfully now, with our collective voices, we are creating positive changes, not just on MSU's campus, but across the nation and across the world. That is bigger than us. This whole thing is bigger than us. This is a movement that will not stop, one that we will not back down from, and one that we will fight as long as we need to. Whether you are a survivor, an advocate, or an ally, we are stronger together. Even though our voices have been silenced in the past, we will continue to rise up and create the change so desperately needed. Thank you.
perhaps now you have a sense of what our meetings have been like. Uh, I mean, with such extraordinary pain and eloquence, um, a sense of loss, and then being filled again with a new sense of hope. I mean, that's what it's been like, and we hope the exhibition reflects that. And what makes that most possible, we've come to think um, are, are works of art themselves. And, and I would like to ask our, uh, two of the artists in the show who are represented uh, here tonight to come and stand, if you don't mind. So, uh, there's lots of work of art and scores of people cre created works of beauty, but there are three really extraordinary works of art. Elena Cram, who's not here, created a beautiful tapestry, a three-part tapestry emergence. Alexandra Burke created a stunning piece that in a sense concludes the exhibition, a, uh, a sculpture that is a butterfly dress with the title turned into butterflies 10 feet tall. Uh, and it's a wonder that you get a glimpse of just as you enter and then it, after you sort of go through the darkness, you, you come to this other amazing place. And then Jordan Fishman, who joins us from the University of Michigan, where she's graduating in just a few weeks, has really created a magnificent, stunning work, a heartbreaking work on the second floor in our art science creativity gallery. So just up those stairs and off to the, off to the left of the gallery. Um, Alexandra's work initially was in her store's storefront in Corktown in Detroit and was wonderful to see. And then she kindly allowed it to travel here and change a little bit, evolve a little bit as all butterflies should. Uh, Jordan did not create her work with the intention of being in this exhibition. We just happened to meet at, uh, when um, I was giving a lecture at the University of Michigan and there was a very fixed, thoughtful look in the audience. And then we learned about this wonderful work that for six months was being, was being created. It's, it's a stunning piece as well. It's, so three wonderful works of art and that uh, and that's the gift of art, to take us, to tell us things we didn't know before, to take us to a place that is both familiar and strange and wondrous. Uh, and as has been said again and again, that paradox that out of such pain and such suffering and such profound injustice, not only by an individual, but by institution after institution, out of all that has come truth and beauty and, and wisdom. And for that, we are forever grateful. Thank you. So a key partner in all of this has been the organization, the Army of Survivors. They have a table just around the corner if you'd like to learn more. Uh, we had a wonderful experience co-partnering all, all year, a series of uh, round tables here and often in this space and as well as in Detroit, exploring themes in the exhibition. Um, and we're continuing to get up to mischief in various ways, we hope. And here to tell us a little bit about the work of the Army uh, is the Army's founder and president, Grace French. Everybody. Um, I believe the tear stains have dried off my dress, so that's good. Um, my name is Grace French, and I am founder and president of the Army of Survivors. We're a nonprofit in the making dedicated um, to bringing awareness, accountability, and transparency regarding sexual violence against athletes at all levels. I'm really proud to be a very, very small, minuscule part of uh, this exhibit and moving forward. These sisters in the audience and the sisters upstairs and the sisters watching are the reason we are here. They're survivors. These survivors are why we all sit here together. Those voices together, each and individual, all 505 and more, are the chorus of voices that brought this community together to create change and to work toward a better future. But of course, it was not just survivors of MSU, USAG, and USOC. Sexual violence survivors from across the state and the nation began conversations and worked to create change. Tonight, we celebrate the hope of a better tomorrow and a future where sexual violence isn't hidden behind institutional bureaucracy, and one where the community rises to protect survivors and future generations. And I am proud tonight to be a part of a community who has done that. 
There are so many incredible allies, survivors, and advocates here tonight. And it is now my honor and my pleasure to introduce Emily Sioma. She is a graduate of, of the University of Michigan with a degree in women's studies and a minor in law, justice, and social change. She has worked in sexual education since 2012 and as Miss Michigan 2019. Her career goals and personal experience influenced the creation of a social impact initiative as Miss Michigan, I Believe You, supporting sexual survivors, or supporting survivors of sexual violence, excuse me, which is both a statement of solidarity and a call for action. Please join me in welcoming Miss Michigan 2019, Emily Sioma. I just have to say again, thank you, Grace, for that introduction and for all the work that you've done. And thank you to those who have supported her and support all survivors alike um, throughout this journey and throughout all of our lives. And um, as Miss Michigan, I had the opportunity of developing a platform which was based out of my own experience with sexual violence. I was someone who experienced sexual assault on a college campus and was failed by my university. And still, um, I continue to be disappointed by our inaction that we're taking on an individual level, on a community level level and at an institutional level as uh, universities. And so being able to be a part of this exhibit, this opening, I'm so grateful and so thankful. And I spoke with Chong, Chong Anna earlier today um, about the power of using our privilege um, to lift the voices of those who've been silenced for so long and be it the inherent privileges that we have based on our identities or the privileges that we have worked to attain. Sharing our privilege is a risk that we must make every single day. The risk that the MSU Museum took in using their privilege to be able to uplift the voices of survivors who have been silenced and disappointed by their university um, will serve to educate and hold accountable our communities and institutions um, on the importance of listening to survivors and believing them, but at the same time it will also um, prove to highlight the once inconceivable impact of our inaction when faced with the truth that survivors were sharing with us. But it's my hope that it will also serve as a moment of healing to many survivors who have felt as though their voices are powerless and their stories are not worth hearing. I was truly overcome with emotion when I first was allowed to experience this exhibit earlier today and it reminded me of the shared pain that all survivors know all too well. Uh, in experiencing sexual violence, our choice and our auto autonomy are stripped away from us, and we spend a lifetime trying to heal that wound. And again, it is my hope that for, this that for survivors, this exhibit will serve as a reminder of the power in each and every one of our voices, and the power in our story, and the power in our journey of healing, which will carry on through the rest of our life. So again, in talking about privilege, each one of us have privileges, no matter where we come from, what we do, or what we look like. And we must make the conscious effort to use our privilege every single day to start conversations in our homes, in our workplaces, in our universities, and in our communities so that we may address the way that there is an increased prevalence in sexual violence in marginalized communities so that we can better support survivors and so that we can end sexual violence. Thank you so much for inviting me to be to be a part of this today. So. Thank you, Emily. When we started on this journey, we at the museum knew this was absolutely the right thing to do. Um, my staff had actually uh, launched into, uh, themselves into my office one, one morning after we uh, had initially uh, had, a, had a working meeting, a sort of our first dinner meeting with, with the survivors. And, um, and, made it very, and the staff made it very clear um, that if we were going to do an exhibit, it wasn't going to be a small exhibit down on the ground floor in a corner. It was going to be a major exhibition. It was going to be a central, the central initiative of the year for the museum. And yet we faced a daunting, Jill De Keck and I, our financial affairs officer, and I faced a daunting uh, realization looking at our balance sheet that this was far beyond our means to do this exhibition justice. And so we turned to our, um, if I can ask, uh, Chang Anna Kanfor, our director of development, to see if it might be possible to have exploratory conversations, if there might be somebody, some group of people out there that would make it financially possible for us to do right by the sister survivors um, and to create an exhibition that was worthy of their stories. And Chung Han is going to tell us a little bit about what happened. I 
I feel like that I've um, known David Miniman, I think probably close to 20 years, um, many lifetimes ago um, when I was a political operative um, doing political fundraising. Um, David has always been a stalwart um, supporter of many progressive candidates that, that I've worked for. And um, I've always known him as an advocate, um, as a progressive, and someone who cared very much about um, the issue of sexual assault. And so um, when I reached out to him to talk to him about the work that uh, the team here at uh, the MSU Museum was doing, that it was going to be this very consultative um, process, um, and told him about it, I mean, immediately, he responded, and um, he and Mick Graywall, the, the team at Graywall Law, um, said that they would um, like to partner with us and um, make sure that we have the resources to, to make this happen. Um, and we couldn't be more grateful um, for that support, and it's a real pleasure to ask um, David to come up um, and just say a few words. Thank you. Uh, before I uh, begin my remarks, uh, both Mark and Chung Anna are much too humble to uh, let you know about an award that they recently received for this exhibition and all the hard work that they have done along with all the co-contributors, and there are many, and there was much work. What was the recognition you got last we were, night? We, we, were, uh, yeah, we were thrilled. We were awarded. Uh, Becky Campbell received the uh, uh, the Sexual Assault Program uh, Individual Achievement Award, uh, and uh, the museum received the Unit Award for the uh, the Teal Ribbon Award for for 2019. Here, here. Good evening, and it is a good evening. My name is David Middleman. I'm the law partner of Mick Graywall, Graywall Law, and this afternoon Mick said these five words, courage, strength, hope, advocacy, and justice. As he and the others spoke while the tree was being readied to be planted, I couldn't help but reflect back to December 18th, 2016, a Sunday morning in my kitchen, reading the article written by Matt Mancarinia of the Lansing State Journal, entitled, They Just Didn't Listen. I didn't know precisely what that meant at the time, but the dots started appearing, and I started my investigation along with our team, and within 60 days, I predicted much of what has happened over the last two years. My first first-hand account of the 111 survivors that our firm was fortunate enough to be retained by was only 14 at the time we first talked to her and all her molestation occurred after 2014. I didn't know the significance of that date, but I think we all do now. I hope so. I talked to a, another survivor, and the third person I talked to was Larissa, and as she mentioned this evening, she told Michigan State University, the adult in the room at the time, back in 1997. The first person I talked to wasn't even born at that time. I kept going, our team grew to accommodate the work on behalf of all our survivor clients. You can ask my wife, Jill, 
sometimes I didn't stop. Day, week, weekends, around the clock, for two years, I knew how important it was for our clients. And now I know how important it is to continue helping to educate people about nice guy, and foul predators, and to increase awareness. So, there go an exhibition that I know is a tribute to all the sister survivors, their families, and to what Spartans will. Thank you for everything you have done and continue to do. Mick and I are humbled to be in your presence and are honored to be part of this mission. Thank you, da thank you, David. Thank you, Mick, for making this possible. Um, I have had also, in addition to working with the sister survivors and the parents and Andrea, it has been the most remarkable journey working with um, really the most gifted museum professionals I've ever had a chance to work with. Uh, uh, as, you, as you'll see as you walk through the exhibition, Kelly Hansen has translated the vision of the sister survivors uh, through into brilliant designs that always surprised and amazed us. She revised uh, quite rapidly when it wasn't quite consistent with the vision. I've never known a design professional um, who is both so skilled and so flexible. These things usually don't go together with designers. It is <laughs> been a miracle to work with you. Denise Blair, our, our, our education director, um, has always been careful to guide us to make sure that the storyline was clear, that the narrative made sense, that undergraduates, graduate students, K-12 students, even preschool students could, preschool children could somehow engage and you'll see an exhibition component that she's developed in a few weeks for K-12. Teresa Goforth is a fantastic exhibitions director. She uh, has guided this whole difficult process uh, in so many ways, and working with her remarkable team has, uh, has created something that is painful and truly beautiful at the same time. I, I don't know how you did it, how all of you did it. And then there's Mary, Mary Whirl. You know, in museums, we deal with stuff. Uh, we have a million objects, I think, in this museum. We don't know all of them. We keep on learning. And um, a curator is someone who both cares for that stuff, but the word curate also has roots in, in the, the ancient classical words uh, for bringing to light. And Mary is enormously gifted at listening, not only to other people, but to the stories that the objects have to tell. And so here to tell us a little bit about the stories these objects have to tell, we'll hear from Mary. So as mentioned, objects do tell powerful stories. We all saw it in the ribbons around the trees. We see it as we walk downtown and see the beautiful prayer flags. Thank you, Valerie. Um, through objects of material culture, the stories and voices of the people who made them and used them continue long after the people themselves are gone. On a daily basis, here at the museum, we see how objects, both those in exhibits in this building, but also those that are housed in our collection space in a different part of campus, serve as powerful and amazing tools for unique experiences in teaching and learning. As a part of the Finding Our Voice project, we have been collecting many of these powerful objects, including many of the items you'll see in the exhibit tonight. Once the exhibit closes, we know the story doesn't end, and that includes the stories that the objects tell. Many of these objects are being added to the museum's collection where they will continue to be accessible, even though they're no longer exhibit on exhibit for students, for faculty, for anyone who is interested in utilizing objects to teach, to learn, and to start conversations. We want these impactful objects of education to continue to share the voices of sister survivors and their allies. Um, so I'm often asked by many of you, what ex precisely does a museum director do, given that there's such an extremely competent staff here? And for the last year, my 
job really has been listening to a series of extraordinary uh, women. And that started with one woman who I'd like to thank, who I would not be here without. And I'd like to ask Ellen Schott Snyder to come out. Uh, so Ellen and I have been married for, we're practically born married. Uh, and I guess this listening journey started uh, before I'd even met Valerie and the whole team uh, when uh, uh, it became clear from a series of emails and correspondence, oh, I guess almost a year ago, that, that these teal, beautiful teal ribbons were about to be taken down because they were seen as a vector of contagion for the, the, the gypsy moths and they were about to be burned. And that seemed absolutely terrible. And I remember staring at the computer, tearing my hair out, thinking, surely someone needs to point out, somebody out there has to point out that this would be terrible to the, the parents, terrible to the survivors, completely unjust, plus it would be terrible PR, and as if we didn't need that again. Somebody has to point that out. And Ellen, uh, practical as always, said, well, dear, in this case, that somebody has to be you. And basically taught me to stop, stop whining. So I sent out a whole set of messages. And fortunately, they were heard by two other really remarkable women, Kathy Wilbur and Emily Gurren, who, who deftly intervened along with Frank Tolisky and others all recognizing the wisdom of slowing things down. And within 24 hours, Valerie and I were able to broker a compromise. Um, and again, someone who had no reason to pick up the phone from anybody at MSU, and yet, but Valerie loved the trees too, and we were able to work out an arrangement um, that brought us together. It was this miracle. And then I was opened up to the possibility of more listening from more extraordinary people. And throughout this whole process, Ellen has been there as a informal, and in some sense, formal advisor, documenting photographically the trees, working with the sister survivors in expressive art workshops, being there to converse with her students off at Brandeis University uh, in the Boston area, and, um, and to be the sounding board. Um, and to listen patiently as I would rail about how hard this was, and she would always remind me it was privilege to work with this extraordinary group. It was a gift given to the museum that we were able to work together. So thank you, Ellen, for keeping the faith and, um, and giving, helping give me the strength to keep the faith with this extraordinary group. So I cannot thank you. Um, we can't begin to thank everybody who's been part of this exhibition. There's a very long list of acknowledgments as you enter, if you turn around, and you'll see it, because we, and it goes on and on. I mean, uh, Kathy and Emily, thank you for sticking with us through this whole process and trusting us um, to do right by, by everybody, by this institution and by the sister survivors. I um, am so grateful to the hard physical work that went in to assembling this under, under uh, the very, Teresa's very able uh, direction. Um, uh, I don't know if Amanda Rosinski is here, um, but she was tireless and ingenious in leaping over uh, all sorts of things. Boundaries uh, of Veronica French and Julie Levi Weston, especially many others helped out in one way or another. But this was, I think many people have said a labor of love um, for all of us and every single person from Jackie and Mike Secord, who sort of supervised this event and events like this, um, to those that have staffed the front desks and the f store and had conversation, difficult conversations over so many people, with so many people about why we're trying to do this, why would a museum do this? And, and to all of you, I mean, it's been wonderful. We were gifted then, thanks to uh, Kathy and her team, uh, with uh, Kevin Appling overseeing the technological side of this and Penny Griffin Davis helping us with uh, publicity and media and guiding uh, uh, Stephanie, our communications coordinator, for a very complex uh, media environment. And this was work above and beyond the call of duty. And one of the things for, uh, Veronica and, uh, you know, knew that, and that Valerie brought up again and again was the importance of every sister survivor being able to find her tree. Mm -hmm. And so we reached out to IT, to our friends in data analytics and geospatial analysis, and they created a beautiful app that now allows all sister survivors um, to find their tree and even be guided directly to it, um, which is a little miracle whenever we tried to thank Jade Freeman and Stephanie's team and Dawn Baker. I mean, they always said, thank us, we ju we're just happy to be able to make a difference. Uh, and, uh, 
it's a, it's a remarkable group of people on this campus and we felt we, we encountered the very, been creating this exhibition, the very best of MSU at a time when we know we have much trust um, to regain with all the sister survivors. But believe us, we have seen so many so deeply committed people. To all of you for being here and uh, listening to the many speeches and listening to us pour out our heart, thank you. We now are pleased to end this program and open the exhibition. Uh, it may be a little crowded. We ask as you go through when you come to the second gallery. The first gallery is difficult. We ask you to exercise self-care as you go through. Uh, there's a wonderful team of, um, of clinicians just around the corner here. And as you go out uh, the second gallery through what marked as an emergency door and go down the hallway and come on out, you'll, you'll pass where our good friends uh, from the sexual assault program are, are located and, and they're very happy to talk to you and give you a space to decompress because we all need that and we all need to look out for each other. So thanks for your patience. Thank you to the sister survivors. Thanks to everyone. And uh, so we invite you to enter and uh, don't forget Jordan's wonderful painting upstairs not to be missed.